I guess my story is pretty typical of many a failed young actress. I came out to LA on a Greyhound bus when I was 18 with stars in my eyes and a dream in my heart, convinced I was going to be the next Demi Moore or Sharon Stone. Yeah, it was the early 90s. Needless to say, things didn't work out that way. I won't get into my life back home in Mississippi in too much detail. It sucked. My parents were strict, humorless, anti-intellectual, working-class Southern Baptist fundamentalists of the fire and brimstone variety. Is there any other kind? They didn't want me to go out to the West. They wanted me and my sister, the lucky one who escaped to college and actually made something of herself, to become nuns and join a convent. You know, screw that. Took off the day I turned 18 and never looked back. I got a job as a waitress at one of those retro 50s diners that were so popular on the West Coast back in the late 80s and early 90s. Enrolled in some acting classes and rented a crappy apartment not much bigger than a walk-in closet, all I could afford, in a pretty seedy part of town where all the liquor stores had steel bars on the windows and all the buildings had gang graffiti on them. The apartment building where I lived wasn't much better, the kind of dump that always had used syringes littering the hallways from the junkies, and you always watched your back, coming and going in case someone followed you and tried to jump you. One of my neighbors got busted in a police raid. Turns out he'd been running a crack den in his apartment. It was a pretty scary place. I guess it's kind of miraculous I never got mugged, or like, killed. I was a pretty naive kid. I was convinced I would just stroll into the big studios, show them what I was made of. They'd offer me a juicy contract, and before I knew it, I'd be up on the big screen playing Tom Cruise's leading lady. Yeah, looking back, I was pretty stupid. But what else can you expect from a dumb southern girl with a 10th grade education living in the big city for the first time in her life? I found out the hard way that unless you have representation, the studios won't give you the time of day much less schedule you an appointment. Same with all the auditions and casting calls I went to. I decided if I was ever going to stand a chance of getting any further than the reception area before security sent me away, I needed to find an agent. Easier said than done. Most of them turned me down flat because I didn't have a SAG card. I didn't even know what a SAG card was. I finally met Bill, a down-on-his-luck third-rate Hollywood agent who looked more like a sleazy used car salesman. Baggy, cheap suit, a tie that would have been considered loud in the 70s, and the world's most obvious toupee. I met him at his agency, which was housed in a cheap office building downtown. Bill's office was dimly lit, sparsely furnished, and smelled of cigar smoke. I sat in front of his messy desk on a folding metal chair under the fly-specked light fixtures and pretty much begged him to give me a chance. He agreed to represent me. Maybe it was because he only had two other clients and needed to pay his rent. Or maybe he really saw some promise in me. Or, more likely, it was uh, the short skirt and low-cut blouse I was wearing. I'll confess, I was pretty good-looking when I was younger and quite stacked. And, I'm ashamed to admit, I did use that to my advantage. I filled out some paperwork and Bill told me he'd be in touch if he landed any work for me. About a month later, I got a call from Bill telling me a TV producer wanted to see me about a new show he was casting. I was thrilled! I met the producer Cliff, a tall, thin guy in his 30s with a ponytail, wearing a Euro trash designer suit at his office, and he explained the premise of the show and the character he was looking to cast. Then he got down to business and told me that he had six other actresses in line for the role and he needed me to show him what made me stand out from the rest of the herd, to display what an exceptional talent I could be. I thought he wanted me to do a live reading, until he sat back in his chair, came undone, and he gave me a pointed look. It was at that point that I learned about the sordid, sleazy underside of Hollywood. The casting couch. This was 1993, remember 25 years before hashtag me too. I'm not proud of what happened next, but I was young and poor and stupid and desperate. 
The first thing I did when I got home was run to the medicine cabinet. A week later, Cliff called me to tell me that I had won a roll. I was ecstatic, convinced I had finally made it to the top, and that soon I was going to be a huge star. Again, things didn't work out that way. The show I was cast in was called Till Death Do Us Part. You might be vaguely familiar with it and distantly remember hearing about it on nostalgia forums and compilations of the worst sitcoms of all time. Hey, you might even have been one of the 200 people who actually watched it during its original run. Yeah, that's a joke. Basically, it was a third-rate Married with Children knockoff that aired on a second-rate startup network for three years between 1994 and 97. The show followed the lives of a dysfunctional lower-middle-class family, the Glovers, an unhappily married couple constantly at each other's throats, and their three screwed-up kids. I played Emily Glover, the slutty redhead sexbot teenage daughter. I was the main draw of the show, the fan service, and the producers always made sure to dress me up in skimpy, revealing outfits to appeal to the horny adolescent boy slash sexually frustrated middle-aged man demographic. I don't think anyone even noticed my acting skills. They were too busy objectifying me. Most of the fan mail I received was just obscene letters from dirty old men and lonely teenage losers gushing all over my body. I just threw it all away. Not really much to be proud of, huh? My 15 minutes of fame basically amounted to being a low-rent Kelly Bundy on a terrible cut-rate sitcom hardly anyone ever watched. The sets were cheap, the budget was low, the humor was lowbrow, and the pay wasn't great, but at least I was able to move into a better apartment. The critics savaged the show mercilessly. Frankly, it's amazing the series lasted as long as it did, considering how dismal the ratings were. And when the show finally wrapped up in the spring of 97 after the third season, it ended on a cliffhanger. My character Emily is torn between two guys, the hotshot rich kid star jock of the school who just wants her as his trophy girlfriend, and the geeky reject who genuinely cares about her. The last episode ends with her conflicted, her decision finally made but not revealed to the audience. Naturally, since the series ended right there, there was never any resolution. Till Death Do Us Part faded into obscurity pretty quickly after it was cancelled, having gone mostly unnoticed during its run to begin with. It was never even picked up to air as reruns in syndication. It never even got a home video release. Although you can still watch bootleg episodes of it on YouTube uploaded by people who recorded it during its original run. After the show ended, I tried to move on to bigger and better things without much success. I had been typecast as a brainless bimbo, and no one would take me seriously. Bill was only able to score a few more roles for me, small parts in low-budget horror movies, and a starring role in the pilot for another sitcom that never took off. A second-rate men's magazine did offer me $10,000 to pose nude for a pictorial, but I turned it down. Bill's calls became more infrequent and eventually stopped altogether. And with that, my brief fling with stardom was at its end. I was officially washed up. Not that I was ever really famous enough to qualify as washed up to start with. By then it was 1999. I was 25 and had done some much needed maturing. I had taken classes during the run of Till Death Do Us Part and finally gotten my high school diploma. I decided to put acting behind me and go on with my life and pursue more realistic goals. I moved back home to Mississippi and got a job working as a receptionist for a trucking company. I met a truck driver named Reggie, who eventually became my husband. And then after I discovered the hard way that he was an alcoholic with serious anger issues and impulse control problems, he became my ex-husband. We had a son somewhere in between, Anthony, born in 2003. I got full custody, plus child support. That, plus the meager royalties I was earning from my time on the show and my receptionist income, allowed me and Anthony to move into a pleasant two-story home in the suburbs. In years passed. I raised Tony on my own, with a little help from my sister Rebecca. I think I did a pretty good job overall, and he turned out to be a pretty good kid. 
I dated a few times, but none of them really made the cut to being boyfriend slash future husband material, and I was content to be a single mother. I had pretty much forgotten about my time in Hollywood and my past as an actress in the rearview mirror. Most of the people I knew never watched the show and didn't even know I was in it. It had been over 20 years, and I figured no one even remembered till Death Do Us Part existed. Until... six months ago. Someone had remembered the show. And me. Someone had always remembered the show and had never stopped thinking about me. Six months ago, I met my biggest fan. And it nearly cost me my life. It was a typical chilly, or as chilly as winter gets in Mississippi anyway, mid-40s. February afternoon, and I had just gotten home from work. The trucking company had been reducing my hours lately. This was the start of the COVID outbreak in the U.S. And I had gotten off early that day. I parked in the driveway, got out of my car, and headed for the front door. It was just past one o'clock, and Anthony was still in school for another couple of hours. And I was looking forward to some much-needed me time alone in the house before he got back. Don't get me wrong, I love my son to death, but he was almost 17 now, and being a single working parent to a teenager who's just gotten his driver's license and is now discovering girls and, oh god, knows what else, along with his own independence and streak of parental rebellion is no easy job. I needed a break. I fumbled my keys out of my purse and unlocked the door, planning on enjoying a nice, leisurely bath, a glass of wine, and some TV before Tony gets home around three. I opened the door and entered my house, flipping on the light. I noticed something wrong right away. My dog Russ, a big six-year-old Doberman, didn't come running to the door to greet me after work like he did most days. Russ? I called out, setting down my purse and removing my jacket. Where are you, boy? I wait for the sound of his claws clicking rapidly across the floor as he scrambled to answer his master's voice, but heard nothing. I listened, feeling a little uneasy. I heard nothing. Nothing at all. The house was dead silent. Russ? I moved through the living room, glancing into the kitchen as I passed it. No sign of him. I wondered if maybe he was asleep upstairs. Russ! Come here, boy! I called up the stairs as I arrived at them. Nothing. I began to climb the stairs, slowly, feeling deeply unsettled. Maybe even a little scared. Something was off. It wasn't just Russ's failure to respond. Things in the house... didn't feel right. I can't really explain it any better than that. It was... it was as if everything in the house had been moved around and then placed almost, but not quite, back in their original location. A sense that things were somehow imperceptibly wrong. But I couldn't put my finger on exactly how. I reached the top of the stairs and looked down the hallway. There were five doors, two on either side and one at the end. Three of the doors went to bedrooms, mine, Tony's, and the spare bedroom we used mostly for storage. The fourth was a hall closet, and the one at the end of the hallway was the bathroom. The first four doors were all closed. The bathroom door was half open, and the light was on. I could see it spilling out onto the carpeted hall floor. The light I distinctly remember turning off after my shower early that morning. I should have turned around and run back downstairs and outside right then and there. I called the police. I should have. I didn't. I think I was trying to rationalize things to myself. To convince myself that I, I was overreacting and everything was fine. Maybe Anthony himself had gotten out of school early and gotten home before I did. Tony? I called out. Are you in there? No answer. I walked on the hallway, seemingly in slow motion. At least that's how it seems now. The only sounds the steady beating of my heart and my breathing. I pushed open the bathroom door and looked inside. The smell struck me first, before I even saw anything. I had actually caught a trace of it in the hallway, but I hadn't been able to identify it. But when I opened the door, it became overwhelming hitting me in the face. The sweet scent of fresh-cut flowers. 
I looked around, taking it in, my eyes wide in disbelief. It took a moment for what my eyes were seeing to actually register in my brain. Roses. Dozens and dozens of roses. Bouquets had been placed everywhere. In the tub, in the sink, on the floor. And then my eyes landed on the medicine cabinet mirror. A message had been written on the glass, printed using a tube of my own lipstick. The red block letters read, Happy Valentine's Day, Emily. I stood there transfixed in shock. Dimly, I realized what day it was. Friday, February 14th. Emily. The name of the character I had played for three years in... Abruptly, I snapped out of it, feeling a sudden urge of terrified adrenaline. Panicked, I turned to bolt down the hallway, downstairs and outside to safety. I was just in time to see my bedroom door fly open and a tall figure clad entirely in black, a black stocking over its head obscuring its features, step out into the hallway between me and the stairs. I, I halted in my tracks, my blood seeming to freeze in my veins. The black clad figure was approaching me slowly, almost casually, closing the distance between us. It spoke. A man's voice. I've been waiting a long time, my love. The man was only six feet away from me, and then four. I suddenly bolted forward, dodging around him and making a beeline, not for the stairs, but for my bedroom door, which was closer. I slammed the door and locked it, my heart racing. I, I, I fumbled for my phone, but, but then realized with a sinking feeling of horror it was in my purse, the purse I had left downstairs. There was a sudden loud thud at the door, causing me to jump. Another thud. The door quavered in its frame, and the man was slamming against it. Thud! I darted over to the landline phone on the nightstand next to my bed and grabbed the handset in a shaking hand. I dialed 911 frantically and raised it to my ear, hearing only dead silence. The line was out. Thud! Then a cracking sound. The door was starting to splinter. I didn't know how much longer it would hold. Uh, I, I turned to the closet, suddenly remembering the magnum I kept in there for home defense. I threw it open and flailed around inside in a wild panic. I found the metal box and opened it. To, to find it empty. My gun was gone. Smash! The bedroom door burst open. I spun around just in time to see the intruder charging at me. He caught me around the waist in a bear hug, and I screamed and fought back wildly, clawing at him with my nails. And then one of his arms released me, and he swung his fist into the side of my head. There was a burst of enormous pain, and stars filled my vision. And then, it all went black. Slowly, the blackness faded away and my vision returned. Blurry at first, and then gradually clearing. The left side of my head hurt, a steady, throbbing pain. I groaned and sat up, rubbing my eyes. I didn't know where I was, and I didn't remember what had happened at first. For a few minutes, all I remembered clearly was unlocking my front door after returning from work. After that, everything was a distorted fog of hazy, half-remembered images that didn't seem to connect to form a coherent picture. The upstairs hallway, the bathroom door, roses. I wondered for a moment if I had gotten drunk and passed out. I sure felt hungover. My head hurt, and my stomach felt queasy and weak. I opened my eyes and turned my head to look around, instantly wincing as a sharp bolt of pain pierced my skull like an ice pick stabbing into my brain. I waited for it to pass, and then rubbed the left side of my head, gasping as this triggered another flash of pain. <sighs> that side of my head felt very tender and sore, like a fresh bruise. It wasn't just my head, either. I felt sick, and for some reason the right side of my neck hurt, too. It almost felt like a bee sting. What the heck happened? What happened? I wondered to myself. I looked around at where I was, really taking in my surroundings for the first time. I was confused by what I was seeing. I was lying in a bed, in a bedroom that wasn't mine. A bedroom that wasn't in my house. 
I sat there for a few moments, bewildered. The shock seemed to clear my head some, and I could think more alertly. I took another more detailed look at the room I was in. It looked like a bedroom that belonged to a teenage girl. The decor had a somewhat dated look to it. Posters on the walls were of Hoodie and the Blowfish, Mariah Carey, and a young George Clooney from the show ER. It looked like the bedroom of a trendy teenage girl from circa 1996. There was something weirdly familiar about it, something that gave me a vague feeling of deja vu. But I didn't concern myself with that right then. I was still trying to make sense of what had happened to me, where I was, and what I was doing here, wherever here was. I got out of bed, standing up, feeling suddenly very dizzy. I grabbed a hold of the bedpost and leaned against it for support until I regained my equilibrium. I glanced down and, and did a double take. My clothes were different. The smart, modest blouse and skirt I had worn to work were gone. I spotted a full-length mirror against one wall and approached it. Uh, I stared for what felt like an eternity, dumbstruck with shock at what I saw. I was now dressed in a very short pleated plaid skirt and a very tight-fitting low-cut blouse that displayed my cleavage encased in a slinky red lace bra. My conservative white cotton bra had also been replaced. The peaked over the top. I was also wearing thigh-high socks and high-heel sandals. But what stunned me even more than my new outfit was, was my hair. My normally straight brunette hair, I had changed the color in my late twenties, was now fire red and had been curled. It looked exactly like it had when I had been in my teens and early twenties. It also reminded me of something, something from my past. I looked at my reflection, utterly flabbergasted and appalled. I looked like some slutty schoolgirl from a porno film. I looked like... Emily. It clicked right then, falling into place. I gasped, shocked all over again as the revelation hit me. I took another look in the mirror, and there was no question. I was dressed exactly like my character, Emily Glover. And my hair had been colored and styled exactly as mine had been when I had been on the show all those years ago. I stared at myself, seeing the ghost of my younger self, superimposed over the 45-year-old woman I had become a middle-aged woman with lines of aging on her face, absurdly dressed like a teenage nymphomaniac in a pubescent boy's wet dream. I noticed something else. I leaned in for a closer look. There was a band-aid on the right side of my neck. A band-aid that hadn't been there before. I carefully peeled it off and saw a tiny red pinprick on my skin. What was this? I glanced around the room and spotted something I hadn't seen before. On the wall over the bed, there was a school pennant. Fugate High, it read in white letters over green. Fugate High was the fictional high school Emily and her older brother Tucker had gone to until death do us part. Ah, now I knew why this room looked so familiar. It was exactly like Emily Glover's bedroom in the series, down to the last detail. The same posters, the same wallpaper, the same furniture. I was dressed like Emily in Emily's room. How? Why? I didn't... I've been waiting a long time, my love. It hit me right then. My memories came flooding back and I remembered everything. The roses in the bathroom, the message printed on the mirror, the man with the stocking over his face, the struggle in my bedroom. My confusion and bewilderment gave way to sudden sheer horror. I screamed out loud, having a complete panic attack. I understood then what had happened. I had been kidnapped. Some sicko had broken into my house and waited for me to get home from work, then knocked me out and, and abducted me. He had taken me somewhere and, and changed my clothes. Oh, the sick psycho had his hands on me and dyed my hair while I was unconscious to make me look like, like the fictional character I had played on a long-forgotten TV show before putting me in a room. I was an exact replica of the bedroom of that same fictional TV character. I touched the sore spot on my neck. He must have injected me with something after he knocked me out to keep me unconscious. How much time had passed? 
And where am I? My survival instincts kicked in right then. I had to escape. Now. Before this crazy freak came back. I ran to the door and turned the knob. <sighs> locked. He locked me in. I spotted a window and darted to it, throwing back the curtains to reveal a solid panel of plywood nailed firmly over the glass. I pounded against it futilely, then collapsed to my knees, weeping with frustration and fear. <sighs> I forced myself to calm down and try to calmly assess my situation and decide what my next course of action should be. Sooner or later, he would come back for me to do. God only knew what. Probably something too terrible to comprehend. I had to arm myself for when that happened. And when he came back, I would ambush him when he opened the door. I began to look around, scouring the bedroom for anything that would serve as a suitable weapon. The only thing even remotely useful that I found was a seven-inch nail file on Emily's vanity table. I had just picked it up when I heard a sound that sent my heart racing and sent a lead ball of fear plummeting into the pit of my stomach. The sound of approaching footsteps, soft and steady. I spun around to face the door, hiding the nail file behind my back, trembling as the footsteps stopped outside. A man entered the bedroom. He didn't look anything like what I had imagined. A brooding, disturbed, antisocial psychopath with menacing features and stringy, unwashed hair and grimy clothes. He was gangly and pale, with curly brown hair, a clean-shaven face, and blue eyes magnified by the thick lenses of the horn-rimmed glasses he wore. He looked like he was in his early thirties. He was dressed ridiculously like a stereotypical nerd, with high-waisted khaki pants, red suspenders, a bow tie, and a corduroy sports jacket. He reeked of cheap cologne. He looked about as threatening as a piece of soggy toast. I was surprised by how normal he appeared. Except for his pale blue eyes. There was something slightly off about them. They were too wide and too bright. With a faraway look in them. He beamed happily at the sight of me. Hi, Emily, he said cheerfully in a weirdly artificial, high, upbeat voice. Are you ready for our date? I, I gaped at him, taken aback. Date? For a moment, I couldn't find my voice. Finally, I stammered, w what? It's Valentine's Day. You said you'd go out with me. I looked down, noticing for the first time he was holding a heart-shaped box of chocolates and a bouquet of red roses identical to the ones he had left in my bathroom. I felt like I was dreaming. This was too surreal, too bizarre to be really happening. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, I said warily. Who are you? He let out a good-hearted, slightly bemused chuckle. Don't you recognize me, Emily? No, I didn't recognize him. I had never seen this creep before in my life, and... Why did he keep calling me Emily? It's me, he went on before I could reply. Eddie, from school? We just talked earlier today in the hallway and you said you'd go out with me tonight. Valentine's Day night. Eddie, that name rang a bell somewhere in my mind, but I pushed that aside for the time being. I asked him, where am I? <laughs> he looked honestly puzzled. What do you mean, where are you? You're in your house, in your room. <laughs> Your parents are downstairs. They let me in. They said you were ready to go. This just kept getting weirder and weirder. This guy, Eddie, or whatever his name was, was clearly nuts. I was still holding the nail file behind my back, but I discreetly tucked it into the waistband of my skirt. I spoke to him very calmly and slowly, trying to reason with him. Look, Eddie, I don't know what you think this is, but you're wrong. I'm not Emily. It's not my name. He frowned, troubled. Yes, it is! You're Emily Glover. You're a senior at Fugate High, just like me. I spoke to him like a parent, gently explaining to their child that Santa Claus isn't real. That was just a television show, Eddie. That was a character I played. It was a long time ago. I'm not in high school. I'm not a teenager. I'm... I'm in my 40s. He shook his head in negation. 
uh-uh, I know who you are. You're Emily Glover. You're 17 years old, just like me. You're the daughter of Glenn and Patricia Glover. Your brother Tucker goes to our school too. And you have a younger brother named Jesse. They're not real, Eddie. They were just characters played by actors like me. He was getting agitated. No, you're real. You're just trying to trick me. You can't back out now. You promised me you'd go out with me for Valentine's Day, Emily. Something in me snapped, exasperated. I, I shouted at him, suddenly furious. Stop calling me Emily. That's not my name. Emily was never real. It was just a TV show, you lunatic. In hindsight, it probably wasn't the smartest move, calling an obviously unstable stranger names and poking a hole in his delusions. But I was frightened, confused, and, and frankly, I downright pissed off. This nutcase had broken into my house, assaulted me, rendered me unconscious, shot me full of drugs, taken me off to God only knew where, had undressed me, and, and who knew what else he had done to me while I had been out, dressed me like a tramp, and he was holding me prisoner here just so he, he could act out some, some asinine fantasy of dating a, a one-dimensional airhead I had once played on an obscure television show more than two decades ago. He flinched back as if my words had hit him like a slap in the face. For a split second, his face crumpled, looking hurt. And then his look changed. His expression darkened, his face contorting with rage. His eyes blazed with psychotic fury. His sudden transformation was terrifying. He suddenly slapped me, a hard, vicious blow that made my ears ring and sent me staggering back with a shocked cry. My head thudded against the wall. I slid down to the floor. My cheeks stung, and I tasted copper in my mouth. I touched my lips and my fingers came away red and moist. He had hit me so hard he broke skin. In the blink of an eye, he had hauled me to my feet and was shouting in my face, his own face so close to me he was spraying me with spittle. Don't ever talk to me that way again. How dare you? Who do you think you are? He was shaking me as he raged on, his face red and twisted in his insane anger. He looked dangerous, monstrous even. I was crying, whimpering, terrified, out of my mind, certain I was about to die. His seemingly harmless, dweeby demeanor was gone. It was as if a mask had been removed and I was seeing the real face he wore hidden beneath, like I was seeing his true personality. The nail file. Oh god. I shoved him back, taking him off guard. He lost his balance and fell backwards on his butt with a cry of surprise. I pulled out the nail file from the back of my skirt and raised it, prepared to leap on him and stick it to his throat. Like a magician performing a magic trick, a shiny silver revolver appeared in his hand, the barrel aimed up at my face, the bore looking as huge as the mouth of a tunnel. I recognized that gun. It was my own 357 Magnum, the one I kept in my closet for protection. I froze. The nail file fell from my hands. He got to his feet, keeping the gun on me. His mouth was set in a tooth-bearing snarl like a mad dog. I pushed the barrel of the revolver hard against my forehead. I squealed in terror, closing my eyes tightly, wondering if I'd have the time to hear the gunshot before the blackness swallowed me. His voice was more composed now, but he was still furious. I should shove this gun in you and blow your brains out of the top of your head. When you try something like that again, I will. I'm getting off lucky this time. He paused for a moment, seeming to regard me. He snorted at me. I don't know what my little brother sees in you. The barrel was removed from my forehead. I opened my eyes. It was as if a switch had been flipped. Eddie was smiling at me gently, back to his normal, upbeat persona, completely nonchalant about what just happened. Casually put the gun away in the back of his pants, as if he wasn't even aware he was holding it. So, he said brightly, as if nothing had happened, and he was picking up right where he'd left off. Are you ready for our date, Emily? I feel like I'd, I didn't have much of a choice. This guy wasn't just wacko, he was full-fledged, dangerous, psychotic. I didn't want to risk offending him in case I triggered him again. I decided to play along, to humor him. Sure, I said, forcing myself to sound cheerful. I can't wait. Great. Oh, before I forget, these are for you. He said, reaching down to pick up the flowers and candy, which he dropped when he had flipped out and handed them to me. Oh, Eddie, they're beautiful. I said, forcing myself to sound pleased and grateful. Thank you! Well, let's get going. We have a nine o'clock reservation at the best restaurant in town. He took me gently by the arm and began leading me out of my bedroom. 
I followed him unresistingly, wondering what in the world was about to happen, what he had in store for me. Something else was bothering me, something he had said when he had blown up on me. I don't know what my little brother sees in you. What did that mean? Eddie guided me out of the bedroom into a dimly lit hallway. I glanced around, trying to appear casual, but I was actually surveying this new environment intently, trying to familiarize myself with the layout and keeping a sharp eye out for any possible points of escape. I seemed to be on the second floor of a two-story house. The upstairs hallway was dingy and somewhat decrepit. The paint faded with years, the plaster cracked, the ceiling water-stained where the roof had leaked. The air was musty and stale, as if the house hadn't been aired out for a long time. Eddie led me past three more doors. One of them, leading to a bathroom, was open. The other two were closed and securely locked with big padlocks. At the end of the hall was a stairway leading to the first floor, and beside the stairway was a window. A window that was tightly boarded shut, just like the one in my bedroom. Eddie brought me to the stairway and we descended into the living room of what I assumed was his home. I looked around, my eyes widening with disbelief. It wasn't just my bedroom Eddie had dressed up to resemble a set from Till Death Do Us Part. Eddie's living room was an identical mock-up of the Glover family living room set from the show, right down to the tacky, run-down plaid couch in the center, which had been the main focal point for the audience same cheap furniture and gaudy wall decorations, same shabby beige carpet. Across the living room, I could see the front door, a window on either side. Both windows had been covered by plywood, and the door had two deadbolt locks on it, the type that need a key to unlock. I knew the front door was almost certainly locked, but for a second, I considered taking my chances and pulling away from Eddie and sprinting for it. And then I remembered the gun, my gun, tucked in his pants. Eddie led me through an arched doorway into his kitchen. I stopped dead, staring incredulously at what I saw. After what I had already experienced so far, I hadn't thought there was anything else that could surprise me. I was wrong. The kitchen was also a replica of the Glover kitchen from Till Death Do Us Part. I noted that the small window over the sink was also boarded up, but I had been half expecting that. What I hadn't expected was that the Glovers themselves would be there. In a manner of speaking, the table was set for dinner, and seated there were four department store mannequins dressed like my fictional family from the show. Each of them had a picture of the face of the actor that had portrayed them, apparently printed off the internet using a color printer, taped to their respective faces. George Denton, a familiar character actor who had played the Glover Patriarch, Glenn Emily's disgruntled, overworked father, who had sadly died of prostate cancer 15 years before. Miranda O'Donnell, a faded TV star from the 70s who had played Patricia Glover, Emily's shrewish mother. Last I'd heard, she'd retired from acting and now co-owned a greenhouse in San Bernardino with her husband. Trey Cullen, a minor heartthrob from the mid-90s who had played Tucker Glover, Emily's sex-starved older brother, he had quit acting after appearing in a slew of direct-to-video movies throughout the late 90s and early aughts to pursue a career in music. Spencer Newton, the child actor who had played Jesse Glover, Emily and Tucker's precocious, smarter-than-his-age 10-year-old brother. He had gone on to become a documentary filmmaker. Eddie dragged me in front of the table, then stopped and turned to me with an expectant look, clearly waiting for me to... What? What did he want me to do? I looked at him dumbfounded, and then looked at my family, seated at the table, and then back to Eddie. Seconds passed. Eddie just stared at me blankly, saying nothing, waiting. I felt a stirring of panic, sensing that he was getting impatient and any second he might go off and have another violent outburst. Finally, I decided to just improvise and hope for the best. Well, guys? I said, speaking to the lifeless mannequins. I guess me and Eddie are going to go out on our date now. I glanced at Eddie nervously out of the corner of my eye, hoping what I had just said had been what he'd been anticipating. 
and detected a small smile of approval. I felt relief. Eddie fumbled in his jacket pocket and took out a small tape recorder. He turned it on. Miranda O'Donnell slash Patricia's voice spoke from the recorder with a metallic, filtered quality, speaking her dialogue from the show. Eddie must have recorded it from an episode. Well, don't you look like a nice couple, she beamed. Emily, you're such a lovely young woman, and Eddie, you're such a charming, good-looking young man. Trey Cullen slash Tucker's voice came from the recorder, jumping in with a quip. Yeah, if you're Helen Keller, maybe. This was followed by the canned laughter of the studio audience. Patricia scolded him. Oh, Tucker, stop it. Eddie's a fine, handsome boy. She addressed Emily and Eddie. You two have a great time tonight. George Denton slash Glenn spoke next, adding in a dry, slightly threatening tone of voice to Eddie. Yeah, but don't have too good a time with my daughter, kid. We're on a budget and I can't afford bail three times in a month. Again, the audience laughed. I felt a peculiar stirring of sad nostalgia hearing their voices. It brought back memories of my time on the set filming those episodes with them. The five of us had bonded during those three years we worked together and had almost really been a family. Back when I had been a young, naive actress, still optimistic about my future in Hollywood. I had never watched Till Death Do Us Part after it was canceled, even though most of the episodes were now available for free viewing on YouTube. Mostly out of embarrassment. The thought of seeing my younger self on TV mortified me. I had buried most of my memories of the show in the furthest recesses of my mind. But hearing the dialogue we had recorded together on that long-ago studio soundstage was dredging those memories back up. Eddie, you're such a charming, good-looking young man. And right then, it came back to me. I made the connection. Eddie. Eddie Caldwell. I felt like I had been punched in the gut. Why hadn't it hit me sooner? Eddie Caldwell had been a recurring character from the second season on. The unpopular school nerd who was the butt of most of the jokes in the episodes he appeared in. The one who was bullied and cruelly pranked by the popular kids at Fugate High. His misery and misfortune played for laughs for the entertainment of the audience at his expense. Eddie, who had been hopelessly infatuated with Emily Glover and whose love had been unrequited. Eddie, who Emily Glover finally agreed to date on Valentine's Day out of sheer pity. This guy whatever his name was, didn't just think I was a fictional character from Till Death Do Us Part. He thought he was, too. He thought he was Eddie Caldwell. Oh, jeez, I whispered to myself as Eddie led me by the hand out of the kitchen to wherever we were going next. Eddie led me down a hallway beyond the kitchen, stopping at a door with another deadbolt on it. Here he stopped and searched in his pockets until he found his keys. He unlocked the door, opened it, and pulled me into a two-car garage. I looked around. The garage door was shut, and there was only one tiny window in the rear wall, which, like all the others, had plywood nailed over it. He took me to his car, a beat-up, rusty old Toyota Corolla, and guided me around to the passenger side door, opening it for me like a proper gentleman. I got in and he shut the door, put on my seatbelt, watching as he went around to the driver's side, wondering if he was really crazy enough to try taking me to some restaurant in town. If he was, then as soon as we got onto the road, I was going to fling open my door, roll out of his car, and take off running, screaming for help. He got into the driver's seat, shut his door, put on his seatbelt, and then just sat there. I waited for him to start the engine and open the garage door. He didn't. Instead, he just pantomimed inserting a key into the ignition, turning the engine, and shifting the gear. I sat there, watching stupefied as he mimicked driving, hands turning an invisible steering wheel making car sounds, vroom vroom like a little kid pretending to drive his dad's car, staring straight ahead with an unnerving blank expression. We must have sat there for at least 20 minutes while he pretended to drive, stopping at imaginary stop signs and red lights. Finally, he slowed down and turned the wheel sharply as if pulling into a parking lot. He mimed putting on his brakes and then parked. 
He glanced at his watch. Woo, we're just in time. I was afraid we were going to be late. What time is it? I asked, genuinely curious. 8.57. Our reservation's at 9. 8.57. It had been less than eight hours since this nightmare had begun. By now, Tony would have returned from school. He would have noticed my absence and seen the signs of struggle in the house. He would have seen that my door had been kicked in and that my purse was still in the house with my phone in it. He must have already called the police. They were probably looking for me right now. But they wouldn't know where to look. I didn't even know how far Eddie's house was from mine. Unless he had maybe left some evidence behind that they could use to identify him. Was he wearing gloves when he abducted me? I hadn't even noticed at the time. Come on, he was saying as he opened the door. We better hurry. He came around and opened my door for me, escorting me back into his house. Aren't you going to give your keys to the valet? I considered asking sarcastically, then quickly concluded that probably wouldn't be a good idea. He led me back through the kitchen and into the living room. I thought for a moment we were heading back upstairs, but instead he ushered me to a door opposite of the one to the kitchen that I hadn't noticed before. It looked like it was probably his dining room. It had been dressed to resemble a posh restaurant. There was a white linen cloth on the table and two places were set with fine china and silverware. Two candles were already burning. Elegant violin music was playing through the stereo speakers on the walls. He pulled my chair out for me, again, like a perfect gentleman, and I sat down. He sat across from me, taking a linen napkin and placing it in his lap. I did likewise. He smiled at me. Shall we begin? Sure, I said, trying to sound pleasant and eager. I glanced at my plate. It looks great. That was a lie. That was a lie. My dinner looked like the contents of your basic turkey TV dinner that had been arranged on a plate and then fancied up with some garnish. I guess Eddie wasn't much of a cook. It tasted about as good as it looked, plus it had gone cold in the time I had spent getting ready for our date and the drive over here. But I ate it with forced gusto, pretending to savor every bite in order to please him. Eddie only picked at his food. He watched me with a fixed expression as I ate, an unnerving blank smile on his lips, the flickering candlelight glinting in his wide blue eyes. He didn't say a word, just watched me eat. I could feel his gaze upon me and it really unsettled me. Minutes passed in silence. I kept waiting for him to say something, anything, but he didn't. In a weird way, it was almost darkly comedic. Like being on the worst first date of your life, both of you sitting there awkwardly, waiting for the other to break the ice with some small talk. I finally spoke in order to break the maddening silence. So, you, uh, come here often? It was all I could come up with. He laughed slightly, an almost pleasant sound. Actually, this is my first time here, but I'd heard good things about it. <laughs> yeah, me too. I replied, thinking to myself, this is madness, pure madness. I was sitting here with a violent, delusional maniac who thought we were both TV characters and had kidnapped me pretending we were enjoying a romantic Valentine's Day dinner at a fancy restaurant. I couldn't think of anything else to say for a while. The uncomfortable silence resumed. You look so lovely in the candlelight, he suddenly said unexpectedly with a tone of utter adoration, taking me by surprise. Why, thank you, Eddie. I replied, trying to sound deeply touched by his compliment. Eddie, I was wondering, why do you like me? I don't like you. I love you, Emily. Okay, well, why do you love me? Because you're the most beautiful girl I ever saw. You're the most beautiful thing I ever saw in my whole pathetic, miserable life. There was a hitch in his voice as he finished, and his face was working as if he was trying to hold back tears. It was an unexpected moment, and for the first time since my ordeal had begun, I felt genuinely moved. He continued, I've loved you from the first time I ever saw you. On TV, he flinched suddenly, as if he had been jabbed with a hot needle and made a sort of choking sound, gritting his teeth. It was as if for a brief second of lucidity, or sanity, or reality, or whatever had intruded upon whatever deluded dream world his mind occupied, and he had to fight it to regain control of his fantasy. In the next second, he resumed, correcting himself. In the hallway at school, I knew you were the girl of my dreams, the only thing I ever truly wanted. 
I want to be with you forever, Emily. I was at a loss for words. I'd love to tell you that his profession of undying love flattered me in some way, but actually it just creeped me out even further. It was the way stalkers talk about women they obsess over and eventually murder. I suddenly felt very cold and scared. Emily? He asked me, suddenly sounding hesitant and shy. I was wondering... Yes, Eddie? I was scared of whatever he was going to say next. Well, the senior prom's coming up, and I know you're seeing Chad. Chad had been Emily's regular boyfriend on the show, the star quarterback of the school football team. But I wanted to ask if you'd... He couldn't go on, suddenly nervous and reluctant to finish. If I'd go to the prom with you instead? I finished for him. Exactly. I felt my heart sink. Secretly, I had been hoping that this Valentine's Day date had been all he wanted. And that by living out his fantasy, he would be satisfied and might let me go afterwards. I should have known better. This freak wasn't finished with me. He was insane and thought he was living in the world of Till Death Do His Part. I sat there looking at him, debating how I should answer. I wanted to turn him down politely and briefly pondered what would be the most diplomatic way to do so. And then I remembered the gun he was still carrying. And how he had slapped me and threatened to disembowel me and do other things. How he had threatened to shove his gun in me and blow my brains out. There was no polite diplomatic way I could turn him down. He would not take rejection well. I had no choice. I told him, Eddie, I would be honored to go to the prom with you. I figured it would at least buy me more time. Time I could use to formulate an escape plan. Maybe the police would find me beforehand. I hoped. He beamed at me with a smile of immense satisfaction. He took my hand in his. You've made me the happiest man in the world, Emily Glover. Thank you. You're welcome, Eddie. He glanced at his watch. Well, it's getting late. I better get you back home before your dad kills me. He took me back into the garage, and after another 20-minute drive back to my house, he brought me back upstairs to my bedroom. I had a great time tonight, Emily, he told me earnestly. Me too, Eddie. I lied. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, Eddie. I waited for him to close the door and lock me back in, but he stayed there, clearly expecting something more. Ugh, it hit me. He was expecting a kiss goodnight. I moaned inwardly. Fighting back my repulsion, I leaned up and kissed him on the lips as tenderly as possible, hoping to God a kiss was all he wanted. To my relief, he seemed content. Smiling serenely, he gently shut the door and I heard him lock it from the other side. I paced the bedroom feeling a great wave of despair. Tony was probably worried out of his mind about his mom, wondering what had happened to me, who had taken me and what they could be doing to me. By now my sister Rebecca would have heard the news. She'd be scared, too. How long was this psycho gonna hold me prisoner here? Days? Weeks? Months? How long could... I stopped pacing, freezing in my tracks. I could hear something. It sounded like it was coming from the room next door. I pressed my ear against the wall, listening intently. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Voices. Plural. Two men were speaking in the next room. It sounded like they were arguing. I had thought Eddie lived here alone. Bewildered, I listened, trying to hear what they were saying. Their voices were faint, muffled by the wall, but I could just barely make them out. No, she's not like that. She's nice. The first voice was protesting. I recognized it as Eddie's normal, slightly high-pitched voice. He sounded upset. The other voice responded, she's just cheap like they all are. This voice was low, sneering and cruel. I felt my skin crawl. I recognized that voice, too. It was Eddie's other voice. The one he had used when he had flown into a violent rage and attacked me after I insulted him. You shut up, Ted! You don't know anything about her! Don't tell me to shut up, you pathetic little maggot! I'm the only person in the world who cares about you! If you didn't have me to take care of you, you would have been dead a long time ago, you ungrateful piece of crap! I like Emily, and she likes me! She said she'd go to the prom with me! Why would anyone go to the prom with a loser like you? I'm not a loser. 
Yes, you are. You're a loser. You always have been. Mother knew it. Father knew it. And I know it. I'm going with her, Ted, and you can't stop me. And suddenly, slap. I recoiled, startled. I heard Eddie gasp in pain. He was whimpering in tears. It's been a long time. Guess you forgot how that feels. Don't talk to me that way. Ever. I'm your older brother. I own you. Your life is only an extension of mine. Eddie just sobbed. What? You want to marry her? You want her to have your babies and live happily ever after? That's a pipe dream and you know it. You're never going to have a normal life with anyone except for me. If you want to keep her, that's fine. Go ahead. Why let her go to waste? But after you're finished, I'm going to have her like all the others. You understand that, Francis? She's mine. They're all mine. The heck, Francis? I stepped back from the wall, shaken and disturbed. I sat down on my bed and my mind was reeling. What in the world had I just heard? Who was Ted? Who was Francis? And what had Ted meant about having me like all the others? Ugh, what were they planning on doing to me? I was more scared than I had ever been. I lay curled on my side in bed. And eventually, I drifted off to sleep. I woke up the next morning, at least I assumed it was morning, there were no clocks in the bedroom and the window was covered with plywood so I couldn't judge the time, needing to use the bathroom badly. There wasn't a toilet or even a bucket I could use in the room with me. I got out of bed and went to the door, pounding on it. Eddie? Are you there? I listened, and after a few seconds I heard him approaching, and then the sound of his key turning in the lock. Eddie, or... Francis stood there, smiling at me in his eerily artificial, spacey manner. Good morning, Emily. I was a little surprised to see he was now dressed in a security guard uniform. The patches on the sleeves of his shirt read Louisville Mall Security. Wait, Louisville? Louisville, Kentucky? Is that where we were? That was 400 miles from the town where I lived in northern Mississippi. Had he really driven me that far while I had been unconscious? <sighs> Unless, was there maybe another city called Louisville I wasn't familiar with in a different state? <sighs> Why hadn't it occurred to me to glance at the license plate on his car when we'd been in the garage last night? Could have given me some clue to where we were. I forced these thoughts out of my mind. I had other priorities at the moment. Uh, hi? Uh, Eddie? Do you think I could use the bathroom? I really have to go. He seemed amused. Of course you can use the bathroom. You don't need to ask my permission. It's your house. Uh, I emitted a fake laugh. <laughs> oh, you're right, silly me. He pointed down the hall. Door at the end on your left. Thanks. I walked past him and headed for the bathroom, glancing at those other two doors that both had padlocks on them. I assumed one of them was Eddie's own room. Why did he keep them locked? What was he hiding in them? I entered the bathroom. If you guessed that the window was boarded up, you'd be correct. And shut the door, then did my business. As I was flushing the toilet, I realized the opportunity I had been given. Turning on the sink to cover my noise, I quickly began to rummage through the cabinets and drawers in search of anything that could potentially help me escape from this mess. I didn't find anything useful. Toiletries, spare towels, toilet paper. I opened the medicine cabinet. Eddie's razor was on the top shelf. It was an electric one and wouldn't do much as a weapon. I was about to close the medicine cabinet when I spotted three prescription pill bottles on the lower shelf. Curious. I picked up one and glanced at the name on the label. Francis Voigt. Eddie's real name. The pharmacy that had filled it had a Louisville, Kentucky address. That cleared that up anyway. At least now I knew where I was and the true identity of my captor. 
I started to place the bottle back when I spotted the name of the medication on the label. Clozapine. I recognized that name. When I was a little girl, I had a schizophrenic aunt who took the same stuff. Clozapine was an antipsychotic. I shuddered. I examined the bottle. It was almost full and looked a little dusty. It didn't look like Eddie or Francis had taken it for a long time. I replaced the bottle and closed the medicine cabinet. I felt an increasing sense of urgency. I couldn't stay in here too long or else Eddie would get suspicious. There was one last place I hadn't checked. The cabinet under the sink. I opened it and spotted a first aid kit. I took it out and opened it, thinking it might contain scissors I could use to defend myself in case Eddie's other personality, Ted, took over again. I flipped through the contents, but there were no scissors. I cursed under my breath, about to give up and put the first aid kit back and leave, when my eyes fell upon a small roll of medical tape. This gave me an idea. Something I had seen in a movie years before. I wasn't sure if it would actually work, but figured it was worth a try. I snatched the tape and slipped it under my blouse and bra, and then replaced the first aid kit, closed the cabinet, wetted my hands under the sink, in case you noticed they were still dry, turned it off, and opened the door. Eddie was still waiting next to the bedroom door as I returned. I made you some breakfast so you won't get hungry while I'm at work, he said. Oh, Eddie, that's so thoughtful of you, I gushed. I get off at six, and then we can go to the prom tonight. I can't tell you how excited I am. Me too, I said enthusiastically without missing a beat. I guess I wasn't phased by anything anymore at that point. We had just had Valentine's dinner last night, but now, from Eddie's warped perception of time, it was already the day of the prom. After that, ugh, I didn't plan to stick around to find out. I'll go down and get your breakfast, he said. Okay, I'll wait right here. He headed down the hall and started downstairs. As soon as he was out of sight, I dug the roll of medical tape out of my blouse and tore off a swatch. I carefully applied it firmly over the metal lock plate of the door, hoping he wouldn't see it. I hid the roll back in my blouse and returned to my original location. A couple minutes later, Eddie came back up holding a tray. He carried it into my room and sat it beside the bed. Voila! he exclaimed. The tray contained a bowl of watery oatmeal, a badly burnt slice of toast, some rubbery-looking scrambled eggs, and a glass of orange juice that had a dead fly floating in it. I felt my stomach turn. Eddie, this looks delicious! He looked at his watch. Well, I better get going if I don't want to be late for work. I'll see you tonight, babe. Then we can get ready for the prom. Ugh. Babe. I can't wait! I said excitedly. He started to close the door. Eddie? I said, having a sudden burst of inspiration. He paused, looking at me questioningly. I flashed him an adoring smile and then blew him a kiss. He caught my kiss, returning my smile, and then closed the door. I silently prayed that the tape wouldn't obstruct the key from turning in the lock. To my relief, I heard it click in place. I listened as his footsteps faded away. I went to the plywood-covered window and listened. I waited. Several minutes passed, and then faintly, I heard the sound of a car engine start, followed by the garage door opening. I heard Eddie's car rolling out and down the driveway. The engine grew fainter and fainter until I couldn't hear it anymore. I waited several more minutes just to be safe, and then I went to the door, hoping the tape had worked. I pushed on the door, and it swung slowly open, creaking on its hinges. I exited the bedroom, alone in the house. I stepped out into the hallway, listening intently. Total silence. I snuck my way down the hall into the stairs. I was moving slowly and cautiously, even though I knew I was alone. For all I knew, Eddie had booby-trapped the house in case I tried to escape while he was gone. I had to be careful. I paused at the bottom of the stairs, looking around the living room. 
The lights were off downstairs and it was gloomy because all the windows were boarded over. There was just barely enough light coming in through the tiny window on top of the front door. The only one not covered, to allow me to see. It was eerie seeing the deserted, shadowy living room that resembled the set from Till Death Do Us Part. For some unexplainable reason, it reminded me of a long-abandoned but perfectly preserved home in a post-apocalyptic movie. I spotted a lamp on the end table. I quickly turned it on. The first thing I did was look around for a phone. I didn't see one. And then I went to the front door and tried opening it. As I had expected, it was locked. I glanced at the plywood-sealed windows on either side of it. I began to look around for something I could use to try prying them open, or even better, a spare key to the front door. I opened the drawers of a bureau to find them empty. Totally empty. I spied a small desk in the corner of the living room and checked its drawers. Also completely empty. It, it didn't make sense. There were no personal items of any kind, no junk mail or bills or correspondence or any of the odd and ends you'd expect to find in a typical living room drawer. It was as if everything was just a hollow prop that existed solely to fulfill Eddie's delusion of being part of the Till Death Do Us Part universe. The kitchen. Maybe there was something in there I could use. I went in. The four department store mannequins, uh, I wondered if he'd brought them from home from the mall he worked at, that had been made to look like the Glovers were still seated at the table. They seemed to be staring in my direction, and it gave me the creeps. I spotted another door I hadn't noticed the first time I'd been in the kitchen. Like the two doors upstairs, it was securely locked with a padlock. I assumed it went down to the basement. I looked through the kitchen cabinets and drawers. Basic cookware and dishes and utensils. I noticed there were no knives or other sharp objects. He must have stashed them somewhere else. I looked in the fridge. <laughs> I gagged. All the food in it was moldy and stank. The expiration date on the bottle of curdled milk was last December. I quickly shut the fridge, then looked in the freezer. All it contained were frozen dinners. I glanced down at the hall that led to the garage, and I entered it. I tried the door to the garage, and surprisingly, it was locked. I saw another door and opened it. It was a combination laundry room pantry, washer and dryer, shelves stocked with canned food, nothing else. This room didn't have a window. Where did this guy keep his tools? Maybe there was a shed outside. Or maybe they were down in the basement. In which case, I was screwed. Dejected, my mission a failure. I turned and went back into the kitchen, intending to return to my room and wait for Eddie to come home and take me to the prom. Halfway across the floor, I froze. I'd heard something. I listened. Nothing. <laughs> I must have imagined it. But then I heard it again. A barely audible sound I couldn't identify. I looked around the kitchen, and the sound came again. I looked at the padlock door I'd assumed led to the basement. The sound seemed to be coming from that direction. I pressed my ear against the door and listened. A moment of silence. And then I heard it. More clearly now. I felt my blood curdle in my veins. It was a groan. Low, muffled groan made by what was unmistakably a human voice. It was coming from down below. I wasn't alone in the house. Someone else was being kept prisoner here. My mind was racing. Who else could that lunatic be keeping here besides me? And why? At least I understood, well, sort of, Eddie's motive from wanting me. The moan came again. It sounded pained. I couldn't tell if it was coming from a man or a woman. Hello? I called out. Is someone down there? A moment passed in silence. Then the moaner began grunting rapidly in excitement as if responding to my voice. I realized they were trying to say something, but it, it was completely unintelligible and muffled. Maybe Eddie had put a gag in their mouth. Hold, hold on! I said, I I'm gonna try to get you out. I looked around for something I could use to remove the heavy padlock. I gave up pretty quickly. <laughs> it was hopeless. I had already searched the downstairs pretty thoroughly and hadn't found any keys. Eddie must have taken them with him. I considered trying to use something as a tool to pry the lock off the basement door. But if I failed, Eddie would see the marks. And even if I did succeed in freeing Eddie's other mystery captive, 
we would still be trapped inside this house. Listen to me, I said loudly. I can't get you out of here, but I'm going to try and get out of here and get help for you. Just hold on. The groan came again, a sound of utter despair. I felt guilty leaving the kitchen, like I was abandoning them for a minute. But what else could I do? I couldn't even get myself out of this nightmare. I went back upstairs, pausing only long enough in the living room to shut off the lamp, leaving everything exactly as I had found it. Back in the upstairs hallway, as I was heading back to my room, I happened to glance at those two padlock doors. I stopped. The padlock on the door adjacent to mine, which I assumed led to Eddie's room, where I'd heard him arguing with his violent alternate personality, Ted, last night, was hanging from its hasp. But it hadn't been fastened. Eddie must have forgotten to lock it after he got ready for work this morning. I stood there, briefly debating the pros and cons of opening that door. Eddie could come back any time unexpectedly, and if he caught me out of my room, intruding upon his personal domain, well, that would probably be the end of me. But maybe that's where he kept his spare keys, or a tool I could use to break out of the house. Maybe that was where he kept his kitchen knives. If he had and I found it, he was going to get a big surprise when he got home. I removed the padlock, hesitated for only a moment, and then swung open his door. I turned on the light and looked into his room. I stood there for some time before I entered, just staring. Oh. My. God. It was the bedroom of a ten-year-old boy. The bed was shaped like a race car. It looked way too small for Eddie to still be using as an adult. He must sleep on it with his feet hanging over the bottom. The wallpaper had a pattern of rocket ships and stars and planets, and there was a bookcase with its shelves lined with stuffed animals and toys. I forced myself to enter and began looking around. I was extremely careful to place everything back exactly as I found it, if Eddie noticed his stuff had been moved around. I couldn't find my gun. He must have taken it to work with him. Nor could I find any tools or weapons. I opened his wardrobe. His clothes were hanging neatly from the rod next to the spare security uniform. At the bottom of the wardrobe was an old scrapbook. I picked it up and flipped it open. The first few pages contained old pictures of Eddie. For the sake of simplicity, I'm still referring to him as Eddie, even though I know his real name was Francis. As a child, I recognized his curly brown hair and blue eyes, with what I assumed were his parents, and a teenage boy with dark hair and a hard, penetrating stare. They looked like a perfectly normal family. But there was something unnerving about that older boy's hard, piercing eyes, and the humorless expression on his face. I turned the page and came upon a picture of Eddie, smiling for the camera with heartbreaking innocence, standing next to the older boy in front of a Christmas tree, its base laden with wrapped presents. Beneath it was a handwritten caption, Christmas 91, Francis, age 5, Ted, age 16. I was startled. Eddie really did have an older brother named Ted. What had happened to him? Where was he? Was he possibly the one Eddie was keeping locked in the basement? I turned the page. An article from a newspaper, the Louisville Courier Journal, dated April 11th, 1993. Local couple dies in auto wreck. The photos that accompanied the article were of the older couple I recognized from the family pictures. Eddie and Ted's parents. I felt a pang of sympathy for Eddie. He would have been only seven when he'd lost them. Could that have been the cause of his mental instability later in life? I turned the page and gasped. It wasn't a news article or a headline. The face of a pretty 19-year-old girl with curly, fire-red hair was smiling at me. My own younger face. It was a picture in an interview that I had given to TV Guide in 1994, when I had completely forgotten ever doing, and the only time anyone had ever been interested enough to ask me for an interview. Not long after Till Death Do Us Parted premiered. <laughs> Feeling numb, I glanced at the experts from the interview. I'm hoping the show will open the door to bigger roles for me. I guess you could say I'm pretty ambitious. I would love to work with Johnny Depp. 
the bottom, someone had childishly drawn a heart with an arrow through it. In the arrow were the initials F, V, and E, G. A shiver ran down my spine. I turned the page and frowned, confused. I, I turned another page. The next few pages all contained news articles covering a series of murders being committed throughout the area. Young women, most of whom had been prostitutes and teenage runaways, had been abducted, raped, tortured, and slain before having their bodies dumped. The articles didn't seem to have anything to do with Eddie. They were dated between May of 1995 and August of 1997. He couldn't have committed them. He, he would have only been 11. Next was a brief item from Entertainment Weekly magazine about the official cancellation of Till Death Do Us Part in the fall of 1997. Next was a brief item from Entertainment Weekly magazine about the official cancellation of Till Death Do Us Part in the fall of 1997. That was when the producers had announced that they would not be renewing our contracts for a fourth season. There were smudge marks on the ink. They looked like they were watermarks. Or, or marks made by tears. This was followed by more news articles about the murders. The last was in July of 1998. I turned the page. I felt like I'd been punched between the eyes. It was a front page headline from the Courier Journal dated September 28, 1998. Killer apprehended an end to a nightmare. I recognized the face in that mugshot. That dark hair. That hard face and those intimidating dark eyes. It was an older version of that teenage boy, Eddie's brother, Ted. Below the headline was an article. I read it. Louisville. Police have finally arrested the man known as the Kentucky Ripper, who has terrorized the Jefferson County area for the past three years, leaving at least 20 victims in his wake. Earlier this morning at approximately 2.36 a.m., a man identified as Theodore William Voigt, 23, a Louisville native, was stopped by patrolman David Morris due to having a broken left taillight. Noting Mr. Voigt was acting suspicious, Officer Morris decided to search the vehicle. In the trunk, he made a grisly discovery, a partially dismembered body of an as-yet unidentified young woman. Officer Morris then placed Voigt under arrest. A young boy in the passenger seat of Voight's car is believed to be his younger brother. Police have not yet said. <laughs> I felt like I was going to vomit. Eddie's... Eddie's brother, Ted, was a serial killer. With trembling hands, I turned the page. Another article from the Courier Journal, dated December 13th, 1999. Killer sentenced to death. Ted Voigt had been found guilty and sentenced to die for his crimes. He was sent to the death row at Kentucky State Penitentiary in Eddyville to wait for his sentence to be carried out. A key witness at the trial had been his 13-year-old brother Francis, who he had been the legal guardian of, and who had been present at and witnessed firsthand several of his murders. Francis claimed he had been an unwilling participant in his brother's crime spree and had acted as his accomplice out of fear and intimidation. The article noted that as the boy was testifying, Ted Voigt had reacted with a violent outburst and it had to be forcibly removed from the courtroom by a bailiff. Oh my gosh. No wonder poor Eddie had gone insane. I felt something for him right then that and until that moment had been a completely foreign emotion. Pity. turn the page. Another news headline. Voight dies by lethal injection. Justice is done. The date on it was July 30th, 2007. After eight years on Kentucky's death row, notorious serial killer Theodore W. Voight has met his end. The sentence was carried out by lethal injection at midnight on July 29th. Defiant to the end, the remorseless murderer's last words before death were, go to hell. And below that, Eddie had scrawled, After you. That was the last thing in the scrapbook. The rest of the pages were blank. I closed it and placed it back at the bottom of the wardrobe and then shut the door. A wave of anxiety overwhelmed me. 
I suddenly felt very vulnerable. I had no idea what time it was or how long I had been looking through Eddie's scrapbook. He could be back any time. I had to get back to my room now. I started to leave and almost tripped over an extension cord running across the floor. I followed it with my eyes from an outlet in the wall to where it disappeared. Behind the bookcase. Some inner voice was telling me to let it go, just, just get out of there and get back to my room before something horrible happened. But I ignored it. My curiosity got the best of me. I went to the bookcase and very carefully pushed it out of the way, revealing a hidden door. It must be his closet. I turned the knob and opened it. The closet was dark, but there was a hanging light cord. I pulled it. The light came on. I had to put a hand over my mouth to stifle a scream. Eddie's closet had been transformed into a shrine. A shrine dedicated to me. The upper wall was plastered with pictures, all shapes and sizes, some overlapping. Publicity shots of me and promos for the show. Screenshots from the episodes you must have printed off the internet. There were even pictures of me from the handful of low-budget movies and TV shows I had appeared in after Till Death Do His Part went off the air. Hundreds of them. At the bottom of the closet was an old analog TV and an ancient-looking VCR, both plugged into a power strip hooked up to the extension cord I had seen. On the VCR was a stack of old VHS tapes. Printed on the label in black marker was Easier bread than done. March 22nd, 95. Of Mice and Glen. March 29th, 95. The Sound and the Blurry. April 6th, 95. The Man's Home is His Prison. April 13th, 95. I recognize them as titles of episodes of the show. Eddie must have taped them off TV when they first aired. There were about a dozen other tapes. I sifted through them all until I found a tape that only had a single episode listed on it. Fast Times at Fugate High. May 23rd, 97. I realized that this was the last episode of the show. I dimly remembered filming it back in early 97. None of us had known at the time it was going to be the last show, but we had heard rumors that the studio brass was talking about pulling the plug after we finished filming that season. But they had said the same thing about the first two seasons, and none of us had taken them seriously. I don't know what compelled me to do what I did next, but I sat down in front of the TV, turned it on, and inserted the tape into the VCR. I pressed play, and watched as the show opened with the familiar credit sequence and theme music. The quality of the tape was badly degraded and marred with tracking errors as if it had been watched a hundred times and was almost worn out. All the commercial breaks had been edited out. I sat there and watched the entire episode from beginning to end, remembering the story as it played out. Emily is heartbroken after discovering her boyfriend, school football star Chad Richardson, cheated on her with another girl. She breaks up with him, then, out of revenge, agrees to attend the upcoming senior prom with Eddie Caldwell, the lonely, skinny reject who had been pining after her for years. Initially, her sole motive is to make Chad jealous. But during their dance, she realizes that Eddie genuinely loves her and she develops feelings for him. They share a romantic kiss. Chad eventually comes back, pleading for Emily's forgiveness, begging her to take him back. Both boys learn about each other and begin vying for her affection. Emily is torn between the arrogant, shallow jock and the gentle, sensitive nerd. She finally makes up her mind and in the last minutes of the last episode, picks up her phone to call whichever one she's chosen. It ends right there on a cliffhanger. No one ever found out if she chose Chad or Eddie. And given our poor ratings, I hadn't thought there had been anyone who cared either way. I was wrong. A lonely, abused, psychologically damaged boy, subjected to God knew what horrors by his sadistic older sibling who lived in Louisville, Kentucky, had cared. An 11-year-old boy who had had what had perhaps begun as an innocent crush on the beautiful Emily Glover, and by extension, 
the actress who had portrayed her, which had gradually become an obsession, who had maybe identified with the fictional Eddie Caldwell, and eventually he had identified with him so much he couldn't distinguish reality from make-believe. He began to believe he was Eddie Caldwell. I understood then what this was all about, what it had always been about. It hadn't been Eddie just wanting to go out with me on Valentine's Day. It wasn't even him wanting me to attend the prom with him. Those were just things leading up to the main event. Eddie had never gotten the closure he'd been seeking. Had never found out if Emily chose him or Chad. He had been waiting all these years to find out which one she loved. I rewound the tape and then ejected it, placing it back with the others in their original order. I turned off the TV, closed the closet, scooted the bookcase back in place. I took a final look around to make sure I hadn't overlooked anything, left any evidence for my visit behind. And then I left his bedroom, closing the door and snapping the padlock in place. I went back to my bedroom, removed the tape from the lock, and shut the door, clearing the lock and gauge as it closed. And then I waited for Eddie to come home. I didn't know what was going to happen after the prom. Maybe he'd snap out of it, return to his senses and let you go. Or maybe he'd kill me. There was nothing I could do but go along with it and hope for the best. I waited for hours that felt like years. I had no clock to measure time. Eventually, I heard the sound of an approaching engine. It rumbled up the driveway. I heard the garage door open. Eddie was home. I remembered him saying he got off at six. I figured it was early evening. I sat on the bed, awaiting the inevitable. But Eddie didn't come up to my room right away. I heard him walking around downstairs for a while, and the sound of things being dragged across the floor. The sound of heavy furniture being moved. What was he doing? I figured he was getting his living room ready for the prom. Eventually, I heard him come upstairs. I could hear that he was panting with exertion. He went into the bathroom. I could tell because it was the only room upstairs not locked, and he didn't pause to dig out his keys. And I heard the shower come on. Probably about 20 minutes later, it shut off, and I heard Eddie exit the bathroom and go to his door. I heard him unlock the padlock and enter, closing it behind him. I hoped to God he didn't notice anything had been disturbed. If I overlooked something when I'd been in there earlier... I'm guessing another half hour passed, and then his door reopened, and... With dread, I heard the sound I had been waiting for. His footsteps approaching my room. I tensed, my heart jumping wildly in my chest, not knowing what to expect. His key turned in the lock, and then the door opened. He stood there, smiling at me. He was dressed in a cheap-looking tuxedo with a red flower in the lapel. His hair had been slicked back straight. It gleamed. I could faintly detect the smell of hair gel. He was holding something wrapped up in a dry cleaner's plastic storage bag. A dress. A prom dress. Well, hurry up and get ready, he said good-naturedly in greeting. The prom starts in less than an hour. He held the dress out to me. I took it from him. He pointed to the bathroom. You can take a shower first if you want. Maybe I better, I agreed. I did really need a shower. I hadn't bathed in almost two days and had been wearing the same clothes since yesterday. Just don't take too long. Don't worry, I won't, I told him, flashing a smile as I walked past him. I entered the bathroom. It was still steamy from Eddie's own shower. There was a paper shopping bag sitting next to the sink with Emily written on it. I opened it. It contained some brand new cosmetics. Eddie must have picked them up for me on his way home from work. I hung the prom dress on a hook in the bathroom door. And then I undressed, showered, patted myself dry with a towel, wiped the mirror clear of steam, and carefully applied the makeup. Then I opened the plastic bag holding the dress. It was sky blue and sequined. 
I was not surprised at all to see it was an exact copy of the dress I had worn to the prom in the final episode of Till Death Do Us Part. I briefly wondered where he had gotten it. I put on the dress and regarded myself in the mirror. I had to admit, I did look pretty good in it in my makeup. I looked... <laughs> I looked ten years younger. Although, you still wouldn't have mistaken me for the 22-year-old woman playing a 17-year-old girl I had once been. I braced myself for whatever was coming next, and then opened the bathroom door and stepped into the hallway. Eddie stared at me with a wide-eyed, comical look of awe on his face. He was speechless for a moment, and then found his voice. You look amazing, he told me in a tone of utter reverence. I smiled. You don't look half bad yourself, I replied. In a way, it wasn't a lie. I, in his tux with his combed back hair, Francis Voigt, a.k.a. Eddie Caldwell, looked as close to handsome as he probably ever had or would. Well, we better get moving, he said, gently taking my arm in his own. The prom starts at eight. Just be sure you get me back home by eleven or my dad will kill you, I told him jokingly. Truthfully, I don't even know if I was just acting along at that point. Some part of my mind was starting to become absorbed in his madness, starting to accept it as reality. I believe they call that kind of thing Stockholm Syndrome, but... Well... He guided me down the hall and we went downstairs. I looked around. I felt like I was hallucinating. It was by far the most surreal thing yet. Eddie had shoved all of the furniture back against the walls, clearing the center of the room to make a dance floor. A dance floor populated with mannequins. Dozens of mannequins. Men and women, all dressed in formal wear, paired together as couples, made to look like they were dancing. I didn't know where he had gotten them all, or where he'd been keeping them, but they were here now. The lights were off. Blue filtered spotlights had been rigged against the walls, casting a murky blue illumination over the dance floor. Music was playing through stereo speakers like the ones in his dining room he had set up in the corners of the living room. Eddie didn't seem to notice any of this. He led me through the living room and kitchen, down the hallway, and to the garage, where he unlocked the door and we once again got into his car, sitting there for twenty minutes while he pretended to drive. Then he brought me back into the house and we re-entered his living room, which had been transformed into the gymnasium a few gate high on the night of senior prom, as if we had just arrived. The song playing from the stereo system was Heaven or Las Vegas. It had been used in the show. All of the music that played from the stereo that night was music that had been used until Death Do Us Part. He led me to a clear spot on the dance floor, and he looked at me. Would you care to dance? I would be happy to dance with you, Eddie. I allowed him to put one hand around my waist and guide me with the other. He slowly twirled around together on his living room floor, surrounded by mannequins, in a world of his own making. He smiled at me tenderly. In his eyes was the look of a man who knows he has finally reached the pinnacle of his whole existence. You look so beautiful, Emily. Thank you, Eddie. It means a lot to me. It really does. I'm so glad you chose to go with me tonight instead of with Chad. I've been waiting for this moment for a long time. It feels like I've been waiting my whole life for this. I'm happier right now than I've ever been before. That's the truth. I didn't know what to say to that. I suddenly felt like I was going to start crying. It feels like I've been waiting my whole life for this. Heaven or Las Vegas changed into Vapor Trail by ride. First you look so strong, and then you fade away. There was something I wanted to say to him. It was dangerous. I didn't know how he'd react by saying it. I might have inadvertently provoked his Ted half to come forward. But I knew I had to say it all the same. I felt compelled to. Eddie? Yes, Emily? I... I hesitated, and then forced the words out. Last night I heard you arguing with your brother Ted. In the dim blue light, I thought I could detect his face turning red. Not with anger, but with embarrassment. He lowered his eyes to the floor. Oh, 
he said quietly. That. Ted doesn't like me very much, does he? He's jealous. Of me? No, of me. He always has been, my whole life. I came along when he was 11, and I think he felt that our parents stopped loving him and gave it all to me. That they liked me more than him. Oh, I said understandingly. I was beginning to see the full picture. The blanks the newspaper articles hadn't filled in. Eddie's tragic journey through life. Vapor Trail had given way to When the Sun Hits by Slow Drive. Eddie looked up with a strange expression. His eyes were looking past me into space and time. When he spoke, his voice was different. Not the high, happy-go-lucky tone I had become accustomed to. It was the quivery, soft voice of a hurt young boy. And then they died in a car accident when I was seven. Ted had just started college, and we didn't have any other family. He had to drop out and come back home to take care of me, get a job in a warehouse to support me. He always resented me for that. He always told me I ruined his life. I'm sorry, Eddie. I told him sincerely. He found out I had a crush on you and... It made him really angry. He started doing bad things to girls that reminded him of you. I felt a sudden chill. I found out what he was doing to those girls and he made me go with him when he... When he did the bad things. He made me watch. He said he'd kill me if I tried to stop him or went to the police. And when I was 12, he got caught doing those bad things. And the police took him away. He was in jail for a long time. I had to go to foster care. My foster family, they weren't nice to me either. I kind of went crazy when I was 13. They had to put me in a psychiatric hospital. They let me out when I was 19. Said I was, re said I was rehabilitated. Came back home. Got a job working at the mall. And then when I was 21, Ted... Ted... Got out of jail. He came back home to live with me. But he was still angry at me. He blamed me for having him go to jail. I think... I think he hates me. And he hates you... Because he knows I love you. You won't let him hurt me, will you, Eddie? No. I'll kill him if he tries. I swear I will. I'll protect you from him, Emily. I couldn't find any words to say. My mind felt like it was going in ten different directions at once. Eddie's brother had died in prison almost thirteen years before. But he thought he had come back home instead. Perhaps it was guilt. As monstrous as Ted Voigt had been, as badly as he had treated Eddie... Francis, he had still been the only family he had left. Perhaps Eddie blamed himself for testifying against his own brother in court, condemning him to a death sentence. His already fragile psyche had collapsed. Part of his mind had refused to accept his brother was dead, and part of his mind had chosen to believe he was still alive. Part of his mind had made Ted still be alive, as a coping mechanism for Eddie. When the sun hits ended, a new song began, Leech by Alice and Halo. Eddie looked up, his face brightening. I always liked this song, he whispered. I looked up at him, feeling tears run down my cheeks. I reached up and gently clasped his face in both of my hands. He looked down at me. I leaned up and kissed him, softly and passionately, on the lips. He wrapped his arms tightly around my waist. For a brief instant, both of us existed in that strange world he had created. I whispered in his ear, I choose you, Eddie. I don't care about Chad. I love you. I love you, Eddie.
He pulled back and looked me in the eye, uncertain but hopeful. You mean it? Yes, I do. The look of pure joy overwhelmed his face. He hugged me in a tight embrace. I love you too, Emily. I always have. I always will. I love you more than my own life. I leaned my head against his shoulder. He held me like that for a long time. Then he pulled away and looked at me, smiling. I have a surprise for you. What's that, Eddie? I asked, suddenly feeling worried and wary. The brief moment when I had felt a connection to him passed. I remembered where I was and who I was with. He chuckled. If I told you, it wouldn't be a surprise. He took me by the wrist. Come with me. Into the kitchen. Okay, he said, trying to keep the fear out of my voice. He took me across the dance floor and we entered the kitchen. He pointed to a chair at the table before Glover family mannequins had been removed. I guess he had repurposed them as some of the dancers in the living room. Sit down, he told me. I did, apprehensively. What was he going to do now? Close your eyes and keep them closed until I tell you to open them. I, I didn't want to. I wanted to be able to see what was going to happen next, but I had no choice. I obeyed, wondering if his lifetime goal now achieved, Eddie intended to commit murder-suicide so that he and Emily could be together forever in the afterlife or something. I heard the rattle of keys, and then the sound of him unlocking a door. The door to the basement. My heart was thudding rapidly. I was terrified. I heard the creak of wooden steps as he descended. A sudden muffled commotion from down below, a struggle grunts. And then I heard Eddie coming back up, pulling something with him. Something that was grunting. I heard a chair being scooted back across the floor. Moments passed. And then... Open your eyes, Emily. Now I was too scared to open them. I willed myself to comply. And I opened my eyes. Eddie was standing across from me, on the other side of the table, beaming with satisfaction, next to a man sitting in the chair opposite me. A man I had never seen before in my life. He looked middle-aged, with gray hair and a goatee. His hands were bound behind his back and his ankles were tied together. A swatch of duct tape covered his mouth. He looked at me, eyes bulging in terror, his forehead crusted with dried blood from a scalp laceration. He was dressed in a high school letter jacket and blue jeans. A sort of clothes Chad Richardson always wore on the show. Surprise, Emily! Eddie cried. It's Chad! The bound man grunted against the duct tape over his mouth. His bulging eyes locked on me pleadingly. The world was spinning around me. I felt like I was going to faint. This, this was too much for me. Too much insanity. Eddie, I said, dazed. What is this? Who is that? What do you mean, who is that? It's Chad, big man on campus, Richardson himself, in the flesh, your ex-boyfriend. He crossed his arms and smirked down at the man in the chair. Well, you don't look so big now, do you? You thought you were so tough all the times you and your buddy shoved my head in the toilet or tripped me in the hallway. Well, you're not feeling tough anymore, are you? Eddie's expression turned serious. He leaned in close to Chad's face. I put up with your abuse for years. I was willing to let it slide. But then you had to go and break her heart. He pointed at me. By cheating on her with some bimbo. I can only dream of having a girl like her, but you did, and you tossed her away like a piece of garbage, and then you have the nerve to come crawling back to her? I can't let that slide, Chad. Eddie? I began, horrified and pleading. It's all right, I chose you, remember? Forget about Chad, he's not- he's not worth it, just- Let him go. Stay out of this, Emily, Eddie told me. This is between me and him. He peeled the tape off the man's mouth. What do you have to say for yourself, Chad? Francis, the man gasped. You have to stop this. It's insane. Don't call me that. Eddie screamed at him shrilly. That's not my name. My name is Eddie. Eddie Caldwell. No, Francis. The man went on, trying to sound calm and rational. It's not. We've been over this and over this in therapy. Eddie Caldwell isn't real. Neither is Emily Glover or Chad Richardson. Your name is Francis Voigt. You're not a high school senior. You're a 33-year-old man. You're just trying to trick me. 
You're trying to trick me and make me think I'm crazy so you can have Emily all to yourself. It's not going to work, Chad. She's not taking you back. She chose me. It's all in your head, Francis. None of it's real. You need to start taking your medication again to get these delusions back under control. I want to help you. You must think I'm stupid like Ted does. Of course Emily's real. He pointed at me. She's sitting right there. Can't you see her? She's just an actress, Francis. She's not actually Emily. Emily's not real. None of them are real. And neither is your brother, Ted. I told you before, Francis. Ted's dead. Eddie stared at him with shock. And then, he winced. His face contorted. My heart leaped with alarm. And I remembered that look. It was how Eddie had looked when Ted had taken over the last time. He looked at the bound man, his personality changing. His face became livid with fury. His eyes turned cold and cruel. He sneered at him. Well, 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 he said in that familiar, low, seething voice. The good doctor himself decided to make a house call. The bound man's face filled with horror as he realized who he was not talking to. No, Ted, please. Ted punched him in the mouth with sudden, brutal violence. I, I couldn't bear anymore. I stood up in my chair. Stop it! He screamed. Ted spun in my direction, his eyes blazing. He pulled the point three fifty seven from the back of his pants and aimed it at me. Shut up. Shut up and sit back down. I'm not done with you. As soon as I finish dealing with him, I'm gonna deal with you. He slowly sat back down, terrified. Ted turned back to the man in the chair and put the piece of duct tape back over his mouth. You've been feeding my brother a load of bullcrap, trying to turn him against me, convince him I'm not real. Well, let me tell you something. I'm as real as it gets. He pushed the gun up against the man's temple. The man flinched back, shutting his eyes. I'm all Francis has got. Ted went on. I'm all he needs. He doesn't need your help. He cocked the gun. He started to pull the trigger. And then stopped, seeming to reconsider. No. That's too good for you. I got a better idea. He put the gun away and then hiked up one of his pant legs, revealing the handle of a huge butcher knife tucked into his sock. He pulled it out. The light gleamed off the blade. A looked razor sharp and a twisted grin formed on Ted's lips. This is much better. Suddenly, Ted winced as if in pain, gritting his teeth. His face flexed. For a second, Eddie took control. His face was pained and voice anguished. No, Ted! He wailed. I, I didn't want to hurt him. I, I just wanted to scare him. Don't do... In the next second, Ted took over again. It was terrifying watching his rapid shift from personalities, how his face transformed back and forth between them. Shut up, Francis! He barked. I'm doing this for both of us. He crouched down and unzipped the bound man's jeans, yaking them and his underpants down around his ankles. The bound man thrashed around wildly, his desperate grunts muffled by the tape. Ted raised the butcher knife. I'll teach you to mess with my brother's head, he shouted. I'll teach you! He began to cut <laughs> deeply. The man howled in agony through the duct tape. I was screaming, screaming at the top of my lungs. I wanted to close my eyes or cover them with my hands to block out the terrible sight before me, but I couldn't move. I felt paralyzed. Ted kept cutting slowly, blood spraying him. Eventually, the man's howls faded to silence. His head lulled forward, sat there motionless, blood forming a pool beneath him. Ted stood up and slowly turned to face me, grinning. He was splattered with blood and looked nightmarish. Now it's your turn. I jerked up from the chair, knocking it backwards, and began backing away from him until I was pressed against the kitchen counter, trapped. Ted... Ted approached me slowly, taking his time, bloody knife in hand, a bloating smile on his face. No. No, no, please, no. You think I didn't know what you were up to? You think I didn't know you'd been out of your room, snooping around, going for my brother's things? You think Francis left his door unlocked by accident? He chuckled dryly at my shocked expression. Well, you were wrong. I left his door unlocked. Deliberately. I wanted to test you, to see if you'd be a good girl while we were out. Well, guess what? You failed. Now, you're going to pay. 
He was only a few feet away. I turned to grab the first thing that came to hand. The pot from the coffee maker, still half full of cold coffee from that morning. I splashed the coffee in his eyes and then smashed the pot against his face. It shattered. Ted screamed and staggered back, swinging the knife blindly. I grabbed the chair I'd been sitting in, using all my strength to hoist it up over my shoulders, and swung it down on his head. The chair splintered to pieces. Ted groaned and collapsed on the kitchen floor. He wasn't moving. I went to him and quickly rifled through his pockets until I found his keys, and then turned and ran into the living room to the front door, knocking over several mannequins in the process. I frantically began trying different keys. There were at least a dozen of them, and the two deadbolts. Eventually, I got them both unlocked. I threw open the front door. A gust of cold night air swept in. Air that had never smelled so fresh or so good. Beyond the doorway lay darkness. And freedom. And safety. Oh, thank God. I whispered in relief. I took a step outside. Something hard was pressed against the back of my head. I heard the click of my revolver being cocked. I froze. Going somewhere? Ted asked me. The party's just getting started. I let out a moan of despair. Put your hands up, Ted ordered me, and back up slowly. I obeyed. Why hadn't I taken the gun from him while he'd been unconscious and I'd been getting his keys? I thought to myself, panic. I hadn't been thinking clearly. Shut the door. I did. Now turn around slowly. I turned slowly to face him. Instantly, he savagely whipped the pistol across my face, an explosion of pain in my cheekbone. I fell to the floor. I could feel fresh blood trickling down my cheek. The barrel had cut my face. Ted towered over me, aiming the revolver in my face, his eyes burning with hatred and vengeance. Small fragments of glass were embedded in his face from the shattered coffee pot. That was for hitting me with the coffee pot, he grunted. He kicked me as hard as he could in the muscle of my thigh. The pain was enormous. I screamed. And that was for breaking a chair over my head. I writhed on the floor. Get up. I moaned. Get up. Now. I don't think I can. I gasped. He shoved the gun between my eyes. You better be able to walk or I'll cancel your show right here. You have three seconds. One. In agony, I forced myself to my feet before he got to two. He went behind me, placing the barrel of the gun back behind my head. I heard him relock the front door and put the keys in his pocket. Start walking. Where? Upstairs. Move slowly. Don't even think of trying something. At gunpoint, he forced me up the stairs and down the hallway. Stop. We were standing at the other padlocked door, the one I had never been in before. I realized it must be his room. I heard the jingle of the keys as he dangled them in front of me, holding one in particular. Take this and unlock it. I did. Now open it. I hesitated. I, I was terrified. I had never seen Ted's room, but based on what I knew about him, I didn't think I wanted to. I knew what he was planning to do to me must be something pretty horrible. But he pushed the barrel of the gun against the back of my head hard. One. Two. I took a deep breath and opened the door. It was dark inside. Go in. I entered. I walked six steps into the blackness, and then Ted told me to stop. Behind me, I heard him flip the light switch. The light came on. I looked around, horrified and repulsed. Welcome to the happiest place on earth. He sneered behind me. If Francis' room was a reflection of his shattered, stunted, childlike personality, then Ted's room was a reflection of his twisted, dark, vile personality. The walls were covered with ugh, images that I wish I could erase from my brain. There's violence, there's 
S&M, crime scene photos of mutilated bodies, medical textbook pictures of deformed fetuses, black and white photos of Nazi atrocities from the Holocaust, and still images from horror movies depicting women being violently murdered. And all of the women had my face. <laughs> pictures of my face from the show Till Death Do Us Part, which had been cut out and pasted over theirs. Go over to the bed, he told me. I did. The sheets were disgusting. I, I was sickened. And then I saw the ropes. Four ropes. One tied to each of the bedposts hanging limply. I turned to him. I can leave. I pleaded. I can go away. You'll never see me again. I'll, I'll stay away from Francis. I, I won't go to the police. He snorted a contemptuous laugh. You're doing all of those things regardless. After we're finished here. I looked him in the eye, speaking calmly and defiantly. Shoot me if you want. Kill me. But I'm not doing what you're about to ask of me. Fine, I'll kill you. But then I'm heading down to Mississippi to find your son. And when I do, I'm going to castrate him. Frightened of that, I, I, I decided to comply. Ugh, I could smell him on the sheets. It was an experience that I would rather not repeat. He methodically tied me down until I couldn't move. He stood, looking down at me, smirking. You know, you ain't half bad looking for an old woman. You looked a lot better in your prime, but still, not half bad now. I can see why my brother likes you so much. Screw you! I spat. He chuckled. That's exactly why I brought you up here. He set the point three fifty seven magnum on the nightstand, only a couple of feet from my right hand. I realized the rope around my left wrist wasn't as tight as the others, and I began twisting my hand around. If I could get loose, I could roll over to my right and... His horrible face was right above mine, only a couple inches away. And he grinned at me hideously. You know, he told me. I always hated having to share with Francis as a kid, but in this case, I'm willing to be generous and make an exception. I spat in his face. He roared with rage and slapped me with all of his strength, knocking my head to the side again and again. You are going to pay for that, he hissed. You are going to pay! He began to grab at my dress. Why? I wailed at him. Why are you doing this? Because of what you turned my brother into. He shouted at me. I tried to bring him up right, make him tough so he'd be a man. And then he found you. He hissed the word with unmeasurable disgust. You've been leading my brother around like a dog on a leash for 25 years. You turned him into a little sissy. You're just jealous because he loves me. I'm something about him you can't control. He doesn't need you or any other woman. I'm all he needs. He would have been better off without you. I shot back. He could have had a normal life if it hadn't been for having a sicko like you for a brother. He slapped me again. Now you're going to get it. I told you what I was going to do last time if you did it again. Pure terror overwhelmed me, as if I'd been dunked into a bath full of ice water. He pulled out his butcher knife, holding it up for me to see. I'll fix you, just like I fixed the brakes on our parents' car. You, you killed them? I said, feeling sick. He shrugged. They spoiled him, just like you did. But, but, but he said you, you blamed him. Because you had to quit college and take care of him. If it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't have had to do it. He placed the edge of the blade against my face. After I finish, I'm going to leave what's left of you in his room as a little surprise. Show him who's boss around here. He began trailing the blade lightly down my throat. Eddie, I cried out, sobbing. Eddie, help me! Don't let him hurt me! Ted laughed cruelly. I'm just as nuts as Francis is. Eddie ain't real, sugar. 
just like you won't be in a minute. Francis! Francis, help me! I screamed. There was nothing else I could do. He kept trailing the blade down my body, and it, it paused. Ted's evil smile faded, replaced with a puzzled expression that turned into wide-eyed shock. He recoiled from me as if he'd been shocked. He turned and threw the butcher knife he'd been holding. It flew across the room, its blade embedding in the wall. Ted grabbed his head, squeezing it between his hands like he was trying to crush it. Get out! Get out! Get out! She is mine! Another voice spoke through his lips. Not Ted's, and not Eddie's. It, it was the quivery voice of that wounded little boy, now speaking with a lifetime of repressed rage that had finally been released. Leave her alone! Get away from her! I never wanted to hurt her, ever! I just wanted to love her! That's all I wanted! He balled up his fist and brutally punched himself in the nose over and over again. And Ted yelled in pain. He fell off the bed and lay writhing on the floor, clawing at his own face. I twisted my wrist around. The rope felt a little looser. Ted stood up, seeming to struggle against an invisible opponent. Some incredible conflict was going on in his mind. It was as if his two or three individual personalities were battling to the death for control of this single body. His face kept switching back and forth between Ted and Eddie. Ted and Eddie. Ted and Eddie. For a moment, Ted was able to wrestle control away from Eddie, Francis, and grab the revolver from the nightstand. Immediately, Eddie took over, raising Ted's hand into his mouth and sinking his teeth into it, biting hard enough to draw blood. Ted shrieked and dropped the gun to the floor, where Eddie kicked it, sending it under the bed out of reach. I almost had my hand free of the rope. Ted took possession again. He punched himself or Eddie in the stomach hard. I'll cut her open. How do you like that? He went to the wall where the butcher knife was protruding and yanked it free. He began closing in on me for the kill. This is all your fault, he snarled. All your fault! With an extreme force of will, Eddie took control. No! He screamed in pure anguish. He raised the knife and, and stabbed himself in the stomach, driving the blade to the hilt. He pulled it out and, and stabbed himself again and again and again and again. Ted took over one final time. There was a look of sheer horror on his face. No, he wailed. You killed us both. I don't want to go back there. I don't want to burn again. And then Ted was gone. Eddie dropped the bloody knife and collapsed to the floor. My hand came loose from the rope. As fast as I could, I untied the other ropes and got up, running to the bedroom door. I started through it <laughs> and then looked back. Eddie was lying in a pool of blood, still barely alive, looking at me. I turned to flee, but stopped. I went back in and knelt beside him. His breathing was weak. He was dying quickly. But he was also smiling. A serene smile. The smile of a man finally at peace after a lifetime of being at odds with himself. That faraway look was gone from his eyes, and he seemed truly lucid and there for the first time. Maybe for the first time since he'd been a child. Oh God, Eddie, I moaned. He's gone, Eddie gasped. Ted's finally gone. I don't have to be afraid of him anymore. Yes, I said. I told, <laughs> I told you I'd kill him if he, he tried to hurt you. Just hold on, I told him, taking his hand. I'll get help for you. You'll be all right. He shook his head, still smiling. No, don't leave me. I want to die looking at you. The most beautiful thing in my life. Eddie, <laughs> I began, feeling tears swell in my eyes. Francis, my name is Francis, and you're, he said my real name, <laughs> and he looked at me pleadingly, stay with me, please. I stayed beside him, the 
color was fading from his skin, from the blood loss. He was almost gone. I love you. I always have. And I always will. Till. <laughs> Till. <gasps> Till. He gasped, struggling to find the strength to finish. <laughs> Till death. Do. Us. Part. He closed his eyes. He was dead. I sat beside Francis for a few minutes after he had died, holding his hand. He had a peaceful expression on his face. And then I looked through his pockets until I found the keys. I got up, left the bedroom, went downstairs. The stereo was still playing. I unlocked the front door, opened it, and stepped outside. I didn't have a flashlight. The only illumination came from the star and the moonlit sky above and the porch light over the front door. I walked away from his house, stumbling down the driveway in the dark to the road. I looked back at the house where I had been held captive, seeing it for the first time from outside. Even in the dim moonlight, I could see it was in a state of disrepair. The paint was peeling, and the grass of the front lawn was heavily overgrown. All the windows were dark because they had been boarded shut from the inside. It looked like a house that had been abandoned for years. The kind of house that all the neighborhood kids probably thought was haunted. And in a way, it had been. Haunted by the vengeful ghost of a murderous, misogynistic psychopath and his tortured, mentally unbalanced brother. I turned and looked down the road. Francis Voigt's house appeared to be at the end of a dead-end street in a residential neighborhood. It was further away from the other houses by quite a distance, as if it had been shunned. <laughs> I began to stagger down the road in the direction of his closest neighbors. I was shivering. It was a chilly February night, and my prom dress was torn to shreds. I had almost reached the next house when I saw something up ahead. Approaching headlights. A vehicle. I heard the sound of its engine getting closer. I lurched down the road like a zombie towards it. It got closer. I stepped into its path, not waving my arms or shouting, just walking. Not thinking that in the dark, the driver might not see me until it was too late and hit me. I was numb, vacant, in shock. The vehicle screeched to a stop, bare inches in front of me. It was some kind of utility maintenance truck. The driver flung open his door and stepped out, looking at me in wide-eyed shock at my appearance. A beaten, bloody woman in torn clothing standing in the middle of a deserted street at night. Are you alright? <laughs> he exclaimed in a shaken voice. Help me. I croaked, and then I passed out. I woke up hours. I woke up hours later the next morning in what I instantly realized was a bed in a hospital room. Bright sunlight was beaming in through the windows. My head ached, and my face hurt. I couldn't get my right eye to open. It felt swollen shut. I gingerly touched my right cheek, where Ted had struck me with the pistol, and felt a bandage. Oh, thank God! A familiar voice cried out in relief to my left. She's awake! I turned and saw two faces that filled my heart with joy. My sister Rebecca and my son Anthony, sitting in chairs beside me. Both of their faces were etched with lines of worry, their eyes heavy with exhaustion and stress. Rebecca's usually perfectly groomed hair was disheveled. They must have driven all night from Mississippi to be here with me in Louisville. What did he do? What happened? My sister asked me anxiously. What did he do to you? I opened my mouth, trying to find my voice, trying to speak. 
but the presence of the two people I loved most in my life left me so overwhelmed that all I could do was burst into tears weeping <laughs> hysterically. <laughs> Rebecca and Tony followed suit, and for a while, all the three of us could do was cry. When we had ourselves more or less under control, Rebecca again asked me what had happened. I gave them my ordeal in broad strokes. An insane delusional fan of my old television show had abducted me from my house and kept me prisoner in his in order to reenact his favorite episodes with me. I didn't feel up to giving them a more in-depth rundown of the psychosis of my captor and his dual personalities, his obsession with me, or what exactly he had tried to do to me. Tony explained that when he had come home from school the day I was taken, he had known something was wrong right away just by the fact that my car was still in the driveway and my purse and phone were in the living room, but I was nowhere to be found. When he had gone upstairs and seen my bedroom door had been busted in, he had called the police immediately. The police had come and done a search of my house. In the laundry room, they found my dog, Russ, dead. The police had come and done a search of my house. In the laundry room, they had found my dog, Russ, dead, with his neck broken. I guess I wasn't too surprised <laughs> to hear that my dog was dead. I had already half suspected that was the case by this point. The police department had searched my house thoroughly, but had found no clues to the identity of my kidnapper, no fingerprints, hairs, etc. They found the roses and the messages he left for me in the bathroom. Happy Valentine's Day, Emily. And after Anthony had explained to them my past as an actress in the show Till Death Do Us Part, they had concluded with a fair amount of certainty that I had become the victim of an obsessed fan. The doctor came into my room around this time, looking pleased to see I was awake and lucid. He explained to me that apart from my cheekbone, which had been fractured, all my other injuries were fairly minor scrapes and bruises. They had found no evidence that I had been sexually assaulted while I had been unconscious the first time, after Francis had taken me from my home. After the doctor left, a couple uniformed police officers came in to see me and asked me some questions. I explained to them what had happened, gave them the identity of the man who had abducted me, and told them he was dead in his house, in a bedroom upstairs. A different doctor, a woman, came to visit me a few hours later. She explained to me that they would probably keep me at the hospital for about a week to monitor me for further physical injuries or psychological trauma I might have suffered. Not long after, Rebecca and Tony left. By then it was late afternoon and they wanted to get back to the motel they were staying at before rush hour traffic got too bad. Rebecca gave my hand a reassuring squeeze and they promised they'd both be back tomorrow. I had trouble falling asleep that night and lay awake for a long time until a nurse administrated a sedative. True to their word, Rebecca and Anthony came back the next day. Although they had to find their way through a throng of reporters clustered into the hospital corridor, assailing them with questions, trying unsuccessfully to cram into my doorway to get a peek at me. By then, the news of my story had broken. It actually made pretty big national news for a little while. Retired TV actress kidnapped by deranged fan. And I was, ironically, finally the celebrity I had tried so hard to become as a younger woman. Although, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, by then the COVID-19 outbreak was spreading rapidly and I was soon overshadowed. My former co-stars from Till Death Do Us Part, Miranda O'Donnell, Trey Cullen, and Spencer Newton, all paid me a surprise visit to see how I was doing. It was a pretty enjoyable reunion, and probably the only real bright spot in that whole ordeal. We caught up on each other's lives. Trey had struggled with alcohol addiction, but was now clean. Miranda's husband had died of a stroke the previous fall, and Spencer was married with his first child on the way. We talked about old times, joking about our time on the show. I was also visited by both Neil Goodman and Kyle Wheeler, who had played, respectively, Chad Richardson and the real Eddie Caldwell on the show, which made me feel weirdly disoriented and a little disturbed. And finally, and probably the funniest thing to happen, I was visited by a producer from the Lifetime Network, 
Attracted by the publicity I had garnered, he wanted to make a TV movie based on my whole ordeal. With me portraying myself, if you can believe it. I seriously debated it for a few seconds, but then turned him down politely, even though I probably really could have used the money to help cover my hospital bill. It seemed like it would have been a pretty tasteless thing to agree to. I didn't want to exploit either my own traumatic experiences or Francis's tragic life story. On the third day, I woke up in the hospital. On the third day after I woke up in the hospital, I was visited by a grim-faced detective of the Louisville Police Department named Carter. He was an older man, probably mid-sixties and not far off from retirement. He explained to me that he'd been one of the detectives who had investigated a series of murders committed by Francis's brother, Ted, back in the mid to late nineties. Detective Carter and his partner had actually interviewed Francis after his brother was arrested. He told me that police investigating the Voight house had made a pretty disturbing discovery. Over a dozen driver's licenses of young women who had disappeared over the past 12 years. They had been found in Ted Voight's old room in a desk drawer. Cadaver dogs had already located at least six graves in the backyard. Police believed that Francis had probably picked up the girls hitchhiking, subdued them, and then driven them back to his house. I felt like I was going to vomit. Detective Carter went on to explain that after Ted had been convicted, Francis had been placed with a foster family in Middletown. He had only lived there for about six months before he snapped and murdered his foster parents, beating them to death with a baseball bat in their sleep. Police had discovered evidence of child neglect as well as both physical and sexual abuse in the house. After that, Francis had been placed in the Central State Hospital, a psychiatric facility where he had remained for the next six years. I remembered what he had told me. That night we had danced together in his living room. My foster family, they weren't nice to me either. I kind of went crazy when I was 13. They had to put me in a psychiatric hospital. The man he had murdered in front of me while under the influence of Ted had been the psychiatrist he had been seeing regularly ever since being released 15 years ago. At some point, Francis had stopped taking the antipsychotics his psychiatrist had prescribed, claiming they caused him headaches. Detective Carter told me that the police had interviewed Francis's co-workers at the mall. He hadn't had any real friends and had been something of a loner who kept to himself. However, they had noticed that lately he had seemed to be uncharacteristically upbeat and cheerful like a man who had gotten some extremely good news. Later that same day, two more detectives from the county where I lived in Mississippi came, having made the five-hour drive to Louisville to see me. I told them everything that had happened. They had been in contact with the Louisville police and had a pretty good idea of everything. Francis had apparently located me using a private investigator he hired. He had taken two weeks off from his work at the start of the month and had driven down to Mississippi, staying in a motel off the interstate. He had paid cash and signed the register, Eddie Caldwell. Police believed he might have been stalking me for a week or better before he made his move, following me and spying on me from afar undetected. He had watched my house and seen me coming and going, getting my daily routine down. He would have known what time I left for work. He also would have known that I tended to park my car in the driveway instead of using the garage. On the morning of February 14th, after I had left the house, he had broken in, forcing open a basement window and squeezing through it. My dog, Russ, had tried to defend the house, and apparently Ted had taken over. After Russ was out of the way, Francis and Ted had opened my garage from the inside and stashed his car in it. They knew this because they had found the tire tracks in the grime on the garage floor that matched the pattern of his and then closed the garage door so I wouldn't notice it when I got home. And also so he could stow my unconscious body in the trunk without being observed. And that's pretty much it. I attended his funeral, you know. My sister and my son thought I was crazy for wanting to do so. But I feel weirdly obligated to. In spite of everything he had put me through, I empathized with him. I still do. That lonely, hurt, orphaned boy who had escaped from one monster 
only to find himself in the clutches of two more. That wounded, frightened little boy whose original tormentor he hadn't been able to escape, even in death. That boy whose only solace had been in the fictional world of a TV show and his dream of being with the girl he idolized. I was the only one who attended the service, apart from the priest who presided over it. He said a brief prayer for Francis and then approached me, having recognized me from TV. He explained that he had known Francis' family when he had been a child, before his parents had died. He said they seemed like a perfectly ordinary, happy family, and Francis seemed like a sweet, sensitive boy, although his older brother, Ted, had always seemed angry and grudging. After the priest left, I stood in front of the open grave looking at his casket for some time. I looked at the family monument above it, reading their names. I was surprised to see that his brother Ted was there with his parents. Francis himself must have paid to have him buried in the family plot after his execution. Joseph Donald Voigt, September 7th, 1946 to April 10th, 1993. Harriet McGill Voigt, May 23rd, 1947, to April 10th, 1993. Theodore William Voigt, March 17th, 1975, to July 29th, 2007. And in the bottom right corner, the newest inscription. Francis Avery Voigt, June 24th, 1986, to February 15th, 2020. Standing there at the grave inexplicably for no reason at all, I suddenly remembered that final song that had been playing from the stereo on Francis's prom mix that night, as I fled from his house for the final time after he stabbed himself to death, finally standing up to confront his personal demon and sacrificing his own life to save the only woman he ever loved. Fade Into You by Mazzy Star. You live your life, you go in the shadows, you'll come apart, and you'll go black, some kind of night into your darkness. I turned and left the cemetery. I went back home with Rebecca and Tony and tried to recover him, put it all behind me. I see a therapist to help me cope with the mental scarring it all caused, and I still occasionally suffer from anxiety attacks and bad dreams, but besides that, I'm pretty much back to normal. There's just one last thing. Something happened last week, something I cannot explain. It was my 46th birthday, and I had just gotten out of the shower. I was getting ready to go out for dinner with Rebecca. And I stepped into my room and stopped dead. Lying on my bed, on my pillow, was a single, fresh-cut red rose. I grabbed my gun from the nightstand drawer, where I always keep it now for fast access, and quickly did a check around my house. There was no one there. The doors were all locked. I always make sure to keep them locked when I'm home alone. And after what happened in February, I also invested some money in a good home security system. Tony was at school. I was alone in the house. I went back into my room and stared at the rose on my pillow. After a while, I sat down and picked it up, turning it over in my hands, lost in thought. I thought about Ted's last terrified words. I don't want to go back there. I don't want to burn again. Had it really all been in Francis's mind? I wondered. Had he really suffered from disassociative identity disorder and Ted had just been a projection of his subconscious, brought on the trauma he had endured as a child? Or had something else been going on entirely? Something that perhaps went beyond the grasp of human understanding. think about Francis's last words to me. I love you. I always have. And I always will. Till death do us part. 
Was... Was even that true? Till death do us part. <laughs>